Welcome to Season 7, Episode 7 of the Ubuntu Podcast. It's Wednesday, the 14th of May, I think. It is. And we're going to discuss what's been happening in the news and the Ubuntu community. If you're listening live, hello. You can send us messages using the chat thing on the website and the hash UUPC IRC channel on Freenode. I'm Alan. And joining me this week are Tony. Hi, Alan. Hello. Laura. Hiya. Good. Mark. <laughs> hello. Hello. Uh, how are we all? Yeah, pretty good, pretty good. Um, enjoying some cake from before, that was nice. Oh, it's really sweet. Thank you to Laura's mum for the cake. That yes. was really, really yummy. Yeah, it's well-travelled, that cake. Is there any more of it? No, but I'll make some more. Yay. Mm. Excellent. Super. Uh, Shall we get on with it? Yeah, let's crack on with the news. Sounds okay. Like a cake-packed show. <laughs> And here are the news. First up, we have a report that the Digital Economy Act, the thing that we all sat and watched MPs talk about in the small hours of the morning um, in 2010, they have been announced, the the, uh, piracy combating measures. Basically, um, a big powwow took place between the ISPs and the motion picture people in the UK and the British recording industry, and they decided that the best approach to stop piracy was uh, a series of sternly worded letters Oh, was this the thing that was going to be three strikes and your internet connection is shut down and you're in internet poverty forever? Yes. Yeah, potentially. Basically, when the Act went through originally, there was a clause saying, we'll sort these details out later. They'll be by negotiation and Ofcom are going to be involved and things. But the industries have got to get up together and, and the outcome seems to be... Um, it's a stupid know. idea. <laughs> well, which, which is the stupid idea? The one where they send you three letters and then kick you off the internet forever? Or the one where they yes. send you letters... All of them. They disabling and limiting internet access. The ISPs didn't like it. Yeah, right. nor did the customers. Well, yeah, but who, so who, where did they get a say in this? <laughs> right, but if you abuse something, mm-hmm. surely you should be prevented from making that thing worse for everyone else. Let's use yes. the usual car analogy. <laughs> if I am being stupid in a car, like, for example, drinking and driving... Yeah, then endangering I, people's lives, yes. I, Carry on. I, I can see how this analogy fits. Go on. Yeah, but I make on. the world worse yes. by doing that, so I get prevented from doing that. So next time you're <laughs> drinking an internet service Every day. Every day. <laughs> I, no. I'd like to see that. Um, <laughs> no, you don't. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have to put a post-it note over the webcam. I was going to say, thanks, <laughs> thanks to GCHQ, we can all in- enjoy that site. So you, you can't think- see the Nuki Brown I'm drinking. But you okay. think that's the only camera? Well, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Um, but yeah, so this is this is quite interesting. After you know four years and nearly the entire parliament, because um, yeah. it was one of the last things that was it, discussed yes. under the old Labour government. In about the, half an hour before nobody the turned government up. was dissolved. Oh. Yeah, um, mm. to see it finally actually kind of being well, this isn't even the implementation. This is a proposal for the implementation. So <laughs> yes. um, you know something will follow. Maybe by twenty eighteen, those letters will be you know. <laughs> so fine. download all your Game of Thrones episodes now before twenty eighteen. Says Otherwise, you'll Alan get a letter Pope. telling you that you can subscribe to something and watch them legally. Right. I or, think that's or, the idea. G- and give me a copy while, while you're at it as well. Says Alan Pope. <laughs> that's Internet Alan thing. at pretty sure, you, pretty sure you don't get a letter just for suggesting other people should do it. That's not on the, oh, list, is, on is the bill, not, is it? Isn't that inciting, inciting crime? Uh, <laughs> I, well, inciting copyright. No, uh, I don't know. I didn't no. say illegally download. Yeah. <laughs> backtrack, but then it said pass it to you. <laughs> <laughs> What makes it worse was I heard somebody else say the same thing the other day, and he's clearly just copied them. <laughs> oh, that's what he did there. Right, what's up on the uh, next news item, Laura? Uh, the Novena open source laptop has raised $314,000 in a successful crowdfunding campaign, and there's still four left, four days left to go as we record, which wow. is what last week t- if you're watching this next week. <laughs> <laughs> oh, here we go again. What, what was the target? I have no $250, idea. $250,000, yeah. I think. And he's yeah. got... Fifty uh, percent more than he asked for. Mm. Okay, mm. so this is for a, a, a an open laptop, as in yes. open Hackable. firmware and and hardware. open hardware and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, quite literally open hardware in that well, you can yes. take the case apart and I don't know. Well, one of the models is in is is bizarrely the the screen is is kind of flat when it's shut, and then when you lift yeah. it, the flat the, the screen of, is facing outwards. Yeah. So when you lift it up. It's kind of imagine a, a laptop round the wrong way, mm. like facing someone else, but all the guts are showing to someone else. Yeah, <laughs> bizarrely. Um, yeah, it's, and then you have to plug a, 
external keyboard in. Yes, it's a kind of bizarre design, but you know, it's the kind of thing that the hackery types yeah. might be um, okay with. But it's it's a portable computer, really, rather than a, an actual laptop in the traditional sense. And one of yeah. the one well, of the top of perks is a wooden one. Yeah, that yeah. wooden one is a proper laptop. Yes. Albeit made of wood. Looks a bit like an old ThinkPad when it's like a really what? old ThinkPad. <laughs> yeah, they're using ThinkPad keyboards, aren't they? they? <laughs> yeah, it's actually a ThinkPad keyboard because it's got the, the touch point in the middle, ah. which makes me oh, drool over it a the little nipple. bit. The nipple. Yeah. So is it fair to say that this is a proof of concept and that if they carry on making them, they'll get more like an actual laptop in well, time? Well, I mean, the, the the schematics are all completely open, so people could... I mean, one of, the, one of the things you can get is just the board, so you could get the board and create something around that board which is like a proper laptop use the schematics to make your own and you know go into business with these open source laptops if you wanted oh right so if one mean, wanted if one wanted yes i think part of the appeal is that it is hackable it's like the raspberry pi didn't come in a lovely designed case with mm. you know all the connectors presented on one end and you know but that didn't stop people buying it in droves I think there's something to be said for you know being slightly unconventional in a hardware sense. I know there are people out there who, you know, wouldn't want to buy something that was arguably ugly. Yeah, it's kind of the hipster approach, isn't it? People carrying around a like laptop, fixie bikes, yeah, the size of a of a house, yeah, you know, just because it's cool. What sort of specs is it? I carry start carrying a CRT monitor around. <laughs> <laughs> just because it's... there are photos of that all over the internet uh, of people taking. Yeah, stupid computers to uh, oh, well, to Starbucks. Yes, taking yeah, taking yeah. an, an iMac, iMac and yeah. popping it on the So table. I'm sure we'll very soon see people carrying these things. Yes. 1.2 so, gigahertz. Of what? Processor. Right. And okay. it's ARM as well. Yes. It's not yeah. x86, yeah, which so is what, interesting. 1.2 gig quad-core ARM processor oh, quad with, core. Yeah. with 4 <laughs> gig of RAM and a 4 gig of micro SD card in the in the base model, although some of the posher models have SSD drives and things in it. Right. I'm more impressed now. I wasn't so impressed with the 1.2 gigahertz. <laughs> yeah. Um, that's probably comparable with your tablet, I would think. Yeah, being yeah, performance, Performance-wise. No. Yeah. Being so, an ARM processor, it's suited right. to that sort of thing. Yeah. So that makes an interesting um, question about what you can put on it, because there isn't, for example, currently an ARM port um, of Ubuntu. Yes, well, there is. is, but can you just download it and put it on something? Yeah, yeah, we've oh, had okay. ARM port for years. Have you? Yeah. Is it, was it available? Yeah. Okay. But yes, it comes running Debian. Right, okay. So I guess that's booting from the micro SD Why are you card? looking at me like that? As if because ARM is something I think that... because when you go to when you go to the download page for Ubuntu, you don't say you don't see a big button saying here's the download for ARM. No, yeah. because it generally <laughs> isn't a single unified download. You have to oh, you have to port it to specific PS hardware because so, so. it doesn't have like ACPI for detecting uh-huh. hardware like PCs do. So ARM ARM boards generally have to have a bespoke kernel with you know the drivers right. and stuff. Okay. So, oh, yeah, it is there. Ports.ubuntu.com is where you go. I think. Right. Okay. All right. Anyway, so um, you, it comes with Debian. Yes. Which is obviously a lot, a lot easier. Yes. That's like a button What? Easier? Well, because it comes with Debian. Okay. It's on so the it's thing when you get it. It comes on, it. on the SD card. Yeah. <laughs> in the same way that Raspberry Pi comes with an SD card. Right. Okay. Right. Yeah. You just. Yeah. Exactly. It's there. <laughs> if it's it easier. works with Debian, it must work with Ubuntu. That's it's a good like, thing. It's grumpy trousers on. <laughs> Isn't the odd numbered episodes everyone's got a bit of a thing? <laughs> it's like it's easier to use Android on your Nexus phone because it comes with Android than right. it is to put yeah. Ubuntu Touch on it. Yeah, it doesn't come with an SD card that you put in your phone and boot from. No. I can think I, everybody's I, had also, too much care. The, the screen, and it doesn't like separate from the battery and like <laughs> expose all the innards on your Android phone. Can there I are get, differences between these. Can I get... Uh, Back to the point? Can I, <laughs> <laughs> right, can I get an SD on. card with Ubuntu on for this thing? For that thing? Yeah. Yes, uh, probably. Alan nicely. Probably yeah. at some point, yeah. No oh, doubt. at some point, yeah. right, yeah. Not, um, well, given the thing doesn't exist yet, <laughs> it's somewhat difficult. I've seen a photo. Okay, it's okay. made of wood. <laughs> Mark, save us from this. The Please. European Court of Human Rights no. Justice, you, yes, you, European Union Court of Justice, in fact, um, has decreed that people have the right to be forgotten on the internet. I think that was probably happening already in some cases. <laughs> <laughs> a case brought by a man who didn't like an auction notice for his repossessed home appearing in Google search results has set a precedent. What precedent has he set exactly? That you should be able to erase your past, on your online past. Right. So what, you can say to Google, remove everything you've got about well, I don't. I think this is wider than just Google. I mean, they were the people in, in this action, but it's, it's wider than that. You know, we, as, a, as a sysadmin 
uh, on a box that has a mailing list on it. I've had emails from people asking if we can remove certain emails from the archive oh, or can yes. you scrub yeah. this out? And and the reasons are various. You know, sometimes we've had people say, oh, I accidentally sent a mail from my work address and it's got my phone number on the bottom of it. Yeah. I was like, well, you know, big wow. Every mail I've sent for the last five years has had my phone number on it and nobody ever phones me. That, that's not a prompt for people to phone me. Um, uh, but, you know, Alan puts hand on pocket container. Yeah, phone. I'm just going to turn my phone off. Uh, so, but other reasons as well, like we've had emails from people who said, um, uh, you know, our, our son died and there is some conversation that he's had on a mailing list and in order to preserve his memory we'd like you to rub it out you know his good name or something yeah, we'd like you to rub out stop some point. But yes or something and and so the, the reasons why you might want to have mm. your past your digital past erased you know can be numerous and you change your opinions i mean if you think like in the history of Lagradio, Axe, Axe views changed. No, no, he's been consistent <laughs> for years and years and years, haven't you, Stuart? Yes. <laughs> he still says things like "no, no compromise, no, 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 no compromise." Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, I, I, I can see why people might want to do this. It, yeah. I think it places um, own. It, it's an onerous thing for other people to have to deal with when one person goes on a crusades to get rid of themselves off online but maybe that's because it's not been designed into stuff everybody assumes that you can't erase your past so they don't count it whereas if there were a button to just erase this person's past and that was part of the original right. design of facebook or whatever yeah but we don't as human nature we don't tend to factor in forward thinking we never like 100 years ago we never thought about recycling you know so you know things were made out of materials that weren't easily recyclable we don't with human nature we don't tend to think forward especially like kids online now you know posting pictures of themselves and posting photographs of their credit card and all kinds of like stuff that you just think oh, well that's dumb yeah. you know through through the gift of experience that we have but yeah oh yeah i agree but my point is that we could do that now now we've started thinking about it like anything well yeah it's retrofitting on something that or was in, not designed or for new it, yeah. software but there's one right. thing if, if, a, if a teenager posts their credit card details online and we everybody can agree that's stupid and and doesn't actually um harm the world by that information no longer being out there but for example if somebody says a political candidate says some particularly obnoxious things in an interview and then right. five years later you know has modified their position and become more mainstream they shouldn't be able to go back and tell the news web paper website that i did that interview to take that interview down and hide no, the quotes that they said i i agree and and that's you know that that kind of thing is ripe for um political satirists to go back and say well you know your your views now are inconsistent with your views in the past and i think yeah. it's good that that kind of you know I, I think there should be some kind of guidelines on what what is a good reason for having your digital past removed and what's not but i don't want to be the person who says what isn't isn't the right thing to do there and there's also one thing to be able to modify this through search engines and search engine results and another thing to be able to talk to individual website masters web right. hosts and it also breaks the internet in yeah. some ways like again if you go back to the mailing list or forums if someone was very prolific on a mailing list or on a forum and then decided one day for whatever reason to have their digital past removed you, you know, whether you can surgically remove each of the posts that that person ever made and then mm. you've got the problem that there are quoted replies that yeah. other people have said so do you surgically remove the quoted reply or do you just blank it out how do you how do you censor that kind of stuff that's a full-time job just for one mailing list you yeah. know for, for people who want to go crazy and you know remove themselves but then the precedent here wasn't about that this was a guy who did his house repossessed and it was for the online auction of it yeah. which right. isn't but, necessarily but, stuff that you I can understand why you'd be a bit upset about it appearing 10 years later. Or yeah, but different people get upset by different things. Yeah. So, you know, you could argue that he, you know, he was unreasonably upset by it because the fact is it was repossessed. Yeah. So, you know, tough. <laughs> get over it. Hmm. Or you could argue the opposite. Uh, moving on. <laughs> <laughs> uh, MIT have released the source code for their Flash-based development tool, Scratch 2.0. Ooh. It's on GitHub. Cool. What what Scratch? So Scratch, uh, there was a Scratch 1.0, uh, which was written in Smalltalk, I think, maybe. I don't know why you're looking at me. Right. No, I don't know why I'm looking at you. <laughs> I thought you might know that. You know everything. Um, so it was, uh, and it was a desktop application. It ran on uh, Linux, Windows, and Mac, and was uh, open source. Um, was it a cat? 
uh, there is Felix the Cat is one of the characters, and it's used by Code Club and other uh, programming tutorials for you know getting kids interested in programming. It's a drag and drop thing. But then there, a few years ago, MIT were uh, rewrote it and made Scratch 2.0 and updated it, and it was a web based thing. But they wrote it in Flash, so um, that was. That was the whole forward thinking thing again. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, and yeah, they, I've mentioned this in the past and it kind of annoyed me that they were in in, uh, in Flash, but they've they've open sourced it. So, you know, maybe someone will port it to something else, you know, like HTML5 or, or something like that. Get on that. Yeah. Good stuff. Um, and in security news, it's been a vulnerability found in the PTY layer, which is the sort of virtual terminal layer thing of the <laughs> Linux kernel. It's been around since version 2.6. I've <laughs> uh, been around a while, basically, and has been fixed and patches have been released. So if, you're, if Sorry, you care what? about local root exploits, Mr. Mark Johnson. Not a sysadmin. Yeah. yeah. Sorry, what? What? Sorry, uh, that was. There's a kernel exploit. Oh, right. Kernel yeah. exploit, but the thing is, you update your machine and it's all gone away, so don't yeah. worry about it. <laughs> Shall we quickly get on to Tony's gaming news with eight, seven, six seconds left? Well, I can't really cover it in six I seconds. Think well, we have to try. I think, I think no, we might have to stretch it so just so that you can well, uh, uh, you know, give I, us the it's full, important the full game. Game. We know like, you've researched this thoroughly, like so, to, you know, come on. It's your own time you're wasting. I like to be very uh, strict on the timings like of this that. show, as you know. <laughs> and. Um, the longer that you there are talking pointlessly, the less time I have to talk about the gaming news. Get and you've already run over, so you may as well carry okay. on. So, um, Unreal Enjon <laughs> developers, uh, Epic Games, have announced that the next Unreal tournament will be developed as an open collaboration with the community of modders. I um, never knew that's how it was pronounced. Yeah, what, is that the, the real pronunciation? It's Spanish. Unreal. Unreal. Oh, okay. Unreal. It's Spanish. Okay. Um, all, dis- all discussion about the game will happen in the open and progress updates will be given uh, by live demos on Twitch, which is the live gameplay streaming site. Um, code and content will be download- uh, will be available to developers on GitHub, which is sort of the big code uh, collaboration site thing. Um, <laughs> that open What's source your idea that's, on that's, there? That's where, that's where he goes into the bit he doesn't know much about. He knows loads about gaming, but he doesn't know much about <laughs> GitHub. Yeah. Um, yep, and the finished game will feature an online shop for contents and mods, although rockers might have to wait a little bit longer, <laughs> hey! um, with revenue to be shared between developers uh, and Epic. Wow. Yeah. So that's really exciting for those of uh, those uh, Unreal Tournament fans. Yeah, uh, I wish we had more time to discuss that, but we don't. Sadly, we don't, do no. we? Oh, well. Um, that's the end of the news. The Ubuntu podcast needs you. Yes, you. If there's something you think we should talk about or someone we should talk to, Tweet at UUPC or email podcast at ubuntu-uk.org. You can also talk to us on the telephone, Skype, Facebook and Google+. Find links to all these places on our website, podcast.ubuntu-uk.org. And remember, if we don't hear from you, we might not have enough content. And that can only mean one thing, more quizzes. And instead of more quizzes, we've got some community news. Hurrah. Hurrah. So manufacturers of quiet computers and custom machined cases, tra- tra- Tranquil PC. Is that how you pronounce that? Right. <laughs> Tranquil PC have teamed up with Canonical to make a cloud in a box. Is that still a... No, anyway. <laughs> called, and it's called the Orange Box. It's basically 10, ser- t- 10 servers in a swanky metal case designed to allow people to easily build and test cloud applications. Yeah. Pretty awesome. I saw this in the office a couple of months ago, and uh, everyone was crowding around it because they had the, the lid off this thing, this big orange box, and uh, we're all peering in. Oh, what's that? And you know, it's very. It was very exciting, and uh, we couldn't say anything. Is it? Is a cloud in a box not just a computer? <laughs> it's, it's multiple computers. You a see, that would be a server. It's a cluster. This is multiple computers in a box with a gigabit switch and a Wi-Fi connectivity. So the idea is you you could um, ask Canonical to come in and bring one into your office if you had a project that you needed to uh, develop in the cloud, uh-huh. but you wanted to avoid all but the... But bureau- not in the cloud. Well, no, but if you, if you don't know if, if it's a proof of concept or maybe a training session, you, right. you, know, you don't like want to spin up an entire cloud wiki. and then go, oh, no, we don't want that. So... You bring it in, and Canonical do a, a couple of days of training, and you get to keep the box for a couple of weeks to prototype and yeah. develop and train on, and then you can move up to big boy clouds. So what's <laughs> what's the benefit of doing that rather than just um, buying a little bit of space on something like Amazon? So often in, in corporate environments, 
I believe the experience is that you you get stuck in a lot of bureaucracy uh, trying to provision servers or you know acquire uh, services from like you know Amazon yeah. or HP or whatever and and also that then means that the data that you're dealing with is on somebody else's machine right that's whereas right. this is an orange box sat on your desk so and you know big, exactly where the data private is project yeah it's a private want. cloud right, basically private cloud in a big orange box without needing your own data center yes right. and okay. but you can also buy them so <laughs> tranquil pc actually sell them how big is this big orange box uh, it's this big I'm that is quite to, big. Yeah. <laughs> yes. See, I was I was expecting it to be like a meter by a meter sort of big, but not that big. <laughs> well, I did have to get up for that. No, it's <laughs> it's about it's about meter. Okay. Um, no, it's not. It's less than that. It's it, it's it's like I don't know that by that. Yeah, you by know, a yard. Yeah, it's, talking it's, about like you know a, a rack mounted server. No chassis. No, it's not. That. It's it's a ruggedized case. The really cool thing is it's got uh, only one fan for the power supply. And the inside, the the ten um, Intel NUX, the little tiny uh, computers from Intel, right. are attached to the outside of the case, and so they dissipate the heat through the through the aluminium case. Yeah. It's, like, like, it's not Mac super Pro. noisy. Uh, yeah, but doesn't look like a dustbin. Yeah, it looks really nice. <laughs> Can so, you yeah. stick stickers on it? You probably could. Yeah, hmm. I would imagine there's plenty of space for them. Tranquil PC made the uh, the home server that I have, and that does the same thing. The motherboard's mounted on the back of the metal case, and it oh, really? cools through um, you know, convection or radiation. It's pretty cool. Um, Dustin Kirkland's posted a blog post. We'll put the link in the show notes. Um, yeah, it's really good. Excellent. The Ubuntu community team have announced a new initiative. Oh, I'm crackling. A new you initiative? Are. Oh. Are you sure it's not your beard? It's definitely not my beard this time. Okay. It's definitely some sort of audio glitch. Okay. Um a new initiative called Ubuntu Pioneers. Uh, and they said they want to celebrate the first 200 app developers who get their apps in Ubuntu, says Michael Hall. Uh, there's a new Pioneers website and there are T-shirts up for grabs. Mm. Mm. This sounds very exciting. So these are like the apps that you'd get on uh, Ubuntu phone and tablets. Yeah. Uh, the first 200 developers who create those apps go in this uh, Pioneers page, which will become frozen uh, once we hit 200. And it'll be on the internet forever and nobody can ask to be removed. You cannot get it removed, yes. (laughs) Take that, Justice. (laughs) Uh, So yeah, it's a a big list and it lists all the applications that each of those people uh, have developed. It's quite cool. It's a nice way to say thank you, to say, look, these are the people who stepped up early on in the project Mm. and developed apps before we even had a hardware device, you know, before we had deals with... With uh, with companies who make handsets, you know, before we had deals with carriers, these are people who started like maybe so, maybe six months or a year ago started developing these apps. So these will be the first two hundred developers. Yep. So after then, if they then develop, if the same people develop more apps after these first two hundred have been done, do they new apps get added to this list? To say no, I think we're going to freeze it once once it hits two hundred. Once it hits two hundred, right. I think what we'll just do is freeze the page as it is, make it a static yeah. page. Job done. They've only got two hundred t-shirts. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, if because if you could have two hundred app developers, but they could have five apps each. Uh, so if one of them does a sixth app, did they sort of I, to be honest, up to be honest, that's list. that's not uh, that's not the the most important thing. The most, <laughs> is it the not? most well, no. It's, the the <laughs> thing is, is to try and give recognition yeah. to the people who actually gave their time to create apps before we've even got the ability to sell apps. So there's no yeah. there's no way to make money from these right now. It's it's you know people are creating free software for a platform that isn't available in shops and we thought we'd give a bit of recognition so that's what pioneers is all about sounds a bit like the hall of fame idea that there was yeah but the hall of fame was one person at a time and took a lot of admin this is uh you know 200 people once it's done freeze it and we don't have to maintain it that's a big win for everyone you could always pdf the page yeah exactly (laughs) it will print it out um put it on the ubuntu fridge yes a uh, friend of the show, uh, Mark Shuttleworth, has delivered his keynote address <laughs> at <laughs> the OpenStack Summit, during which he revealed the world's fastest supercomputer runs on Ubuntu Ooh. and a bunch of other stuff as well. Ooh. Yes. It's quite interesting. He, he always, whenever he does his, his keynotes, uh, he, uh, he try, especially at uh, OpenStack, he tries to give a live demo. Well, I don't say try to give. He gives a live demo. <laughs> yeah. And he, he has the oh, demo the- gods on his side. And... Uh, Invariably, they work really well. 
cool. Ooh, he did it again. We'll put a link to the video in the show notes. It's quite interesting to watch. Somebody did say, you know, he's a very confident man. He builds a, a cluster live on stage. Very few CEOs would step up and do that. Not yeah. that he's CEO, he's obviously you know, above that. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, very few people would set up and I don't I get to want to do Jane a disservice. Um <laughs> but you know, very few people would step up and yeah. do that and have the, the technical chops to do it as well. Yeah. Yeah, it's pretty good. Yeah, it's giving a presentation. There's obviously a bit of sales pitch, a bit of marketing in there, but also, you know, he's a geek at heart. You know, he's got a garage Absolutely. full of servers just like the rest of us. So, you know, it's I think he, he relishes in giving a, a live demo and showing that the product actually works. I bet he's got a double garage, hasn't he? I don't know. I bet. I'd be <laughs> Um, there's been an interesting blog post written by Bob, who has uh, done some analysis on the uh, errors.ubuntu.com website, which is where the automated crash reports get uh, sent. Well, yes. they, get, well, they, well, get they sent. optionally get sent. There. They, uh, yes, if, if an application crashes, you get the option to send a crash report. If you do, it will go on to this website in due course. And you can see interesting graphs about stats and things. And you can see the cycle of crash reports change as a new release is brought out and people upgrade to it and therefore stop getting crash reports on the old version oh. and things like that. It's quite an interesting uh, little analysis that's gone on there. Yeah, he's picked out some some bits of data about certain points in the in the um, in the life cycle of a of a release and how you know where the peaks and troughs are and yeah, it's worth a look. Yeah, basically, there's a huge number of crash reports from the days immediately after a release, so two or three days <laughs> after that. release. Yeah, and then it drops smoothly off over time, presumably because people are actually releasing fixes for these bugs. Yeah, well, I mean. You can speculate about you know why why they drop off, and actually there is obviously data behind this. You can you can go and pick on each individual error and go and find the bug behind it. it links to mm. the bug behind it, and then from that you can find the merge request that fixed it and when it landed. So you can say, well, that one tailed off on this day because that's when it landed in the store, but then uh, in the um, software center or in the repository. But then you know how often do people update their machines, and are they updating? And you know you you probably see it trail off a bit. But then a couple of peaks when there are people who update their machines a bit later, that kind of stuff. So there's yeah. there's a lot of speculation about uh, you know um, uh, stuff. Yes, the theory behind why the peak and trough at various times, and yeah, you could probably have a full time job figuring that out. Cool. So the uh, do desktop team have proposed adding a new flavor of Ubuntu, um, so that they can test out the unity 8 desktop or people can try out the unity 8 desktop. yeah they want to have an official flavor a unity 8 flavor so rather at the moment obviously the the default ubuntu desktop is unity 7 which is the one that you've got on your 1204 1210 1310 you know 1404 but uh on the phone we use unity 8 phone and tablets unity 8 right yeah and um the view is in the future that will be a um the default desktop and um so what they wanted to do is have an iso image that you can test that out and test out apps on on that without having the other desktops around or any Mm. other Mm. you know stuff well that sounds really good it was only proposed today so um yeah that should happen soon you heard it here first well yes unless you (laughs) read the new mailing list in which case you heard it earlier and finally Canonical will be demonstrating Ubuntu Touch at Mobile Asia Expo on the 11th to 13th of June so if you're in the area Presumably that means in Asia somewhere. Area. <laughs> Why not pop along? <laughs> if, you're, if you're mobile in Asia, go along to the Mobile Asia Expo. Yes. I guess it sounds like fun. That's yeah. the end of the news. Where did the time go? That's all for episode seven. We'll be back next week when we'll be talking to Graham Morrison about Linux Voice and the new Linux magazine, which was crowdfunded at the end of last year. Yeah. So if you're listening live, stay tuned because you're going to be able to hear that now. But uh, if you're downloading, come back next week. We we do make these things easy for ourselves, don't we? (laughs) Anyway, thanks for listening, everybody. We'll see you next time. Goodbye. Bye. Bye.